but it is my great pleasure and my honor to introduce the first person who's going to officially welcome you all to News Exchange 2017. Please join me in welcoming the newly appointed, eight weeks ago, newly appointed Director General of the European Broadcasting Union, Noel Curran. Thank you all very much. Thanks to John and Ahmed for that. I'm going to, it was spectacular, I'm going to uh, spare you all my uh, river dance moves, <laughs> unless we need to clear the building and a fire alert. Um, but uh, I'm delighted to be here to open News Exchange, and I also want to echo what Amy has said and thank NOS uh, for the enormous work, the professionalism, the way they've approached everything over the last few days has been hugely impressive, exemplary, and I can say that we and, and I am very grateful to them. I'm pleased that the EBU can bring together such a diversity of executives, journalists, presenters and technologists. I'm particularly delighted to be here because of my own background. I grew up a few miles from the border with Northern Ireland at the height of the conflict. I still remember the important daily ritual of sitting down with my father and my younger brother to watch RTE, BBC or ITN news broadcasts just to get different perspectives and insights on something that was happening literally just up the road. That experience, I think, inspired me to become a journalist, as it did my brother. Since then, I've worked as a reporter, news editor, TV present, present, producer and editor of Current Affairs. I have also worked in the commercial and public sectors of media, and I know firsthand the challenges and qualities of both. Like everyone here, I care about news and journalism, where it's going, how, how it can be best sustained, improved, made more relevant to the public. I have never claimed that public service media has a monopoly on quality when it comes to news, but we do have particular, sometimes legal responsibilities for news provision. I have always welcomed those responsibilities, and I still feel passionate about the impact news allows public service organizations to have with their audience. News is part of my DNA. It will stay part of the DNA of the EBU so long as I'm Director General. Given the hectic pace of news, events like News Exchange are particularly important. They should allow us to stand back a little, reflect, consider the broader challenges and consequences of what we do. The digital revolution, as we all know, has massively expanded the reach of news. It's democratized comment, it's allowed new voices to be heard, and it has driven the most fantastic innovation in our industry. The last few years have also, though, taught us some pretty fundamental truths. We know that that revolution has made it easy to find information of all kinds, but much harder to know what you can trust and rely on. We know it's easy to find people, perspectives and media outlets that you agree with, and just as easy to avoid and ignore those that you don't. We know it's easy to find small communities of interest, but much harder to bring big, diverse audiences together for anything worthwhile. We know it's easy to publish, aggregate and comment, but it is much harder and getting harder every day and week to find the financial support for tough investigative journalism, beat reporting and international reporting. However, I strongly believe public and private commercial and licensee funded, all of us who care about news and its importance must try to find the common ground between us and try to effect change. The EBU, representing 73 broadcasters in 56 countries, is willing and open, and I am, for that discussion, open to form new alliances on important issues that affect all of us in the media. We are willing to take a leadership role with others in trying to identify this common ground with those outside of public service media and then push for change. And there is a lot of common ground for discussion. I think we've all reached our threshold of hearing references to the term fake news, whatever that even means now. But 
That phrase shouldn't blind us to the fact that significant issues are still at stake in the digital world. We may now, possibly, be entering a phase where political and regulatory reaction is coming. The recent congressional hearings in Washington about the US elections have increased debate and attention on this issue worldwide. How and at what speed authorities react, we don't know. But those of us involved in news production, both public and commercial, need to be heard in this debate. News media organizations are now spending a lot of money at a difficult time fact-checking information on platforms that dwarf them in scale, income, and resources. Do the platform's late conversion to third-party fact-checking tools and alerts go far enough, given the extraordinary incomes they generate? We need a voice, or many voices, in this debate. We need to express our views with the regulators who are considering change, and with the companies themselves who are trying to preempt the regulatory reaction. We are not external to any of this. It affects all of us. In parallel to the increased questioning of the role of social media and its role in news, there has also been a relentless attack on the impartiality of what is often termed mainstream media. Impartial news reporting has become a target of both the left and right in many countries. As the EBU's Bill Dunlop in his excellent report, Perfect Storm, describes, in Germany, the derogatory term Lügenpresse or lying press has re-emerged bringing with it ugly uh, memories of a past era. In Finland, YLE, YLE has been forced to call in police because of mail and social media intimidation campaigns. There are so many, so many other examples across this room and across the world. Also in the political world, the notion of impartiality is itself now being routinely attacked as part of a key political strategy everywhere. A few weeks ago, I was reading a lecture by broadcaster Nick, Nick Robinson, and I was struck by his reference to Paul Mason, formerly a very distinguished colleague of his at BBC and Channel 4, who is now a campaigner for British Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn. Robinson quotes Mason as saying, we see the media as the enemy navy. We need our own navy. This is from a former senior BBC journalist. Similarly, when President Trump says he wants to use social media to go around the news media, does he not really mean he wants to use social media to go straight through it? Impartial news media is now a key target, and social media and video sharing platforms are part of a new toolkit. How, how news media organizations react to these changing dynamics is critically important. Here again, there is much common ground, room for dialogue and discussions. Do we actually discuss these issues together at a senior level outside of media conferences like this one? I'm not sure we do, but I am sure that we should do. There is also common ground on the elephant or elephants in the room. And some of them are represented here today and are very, very welcome. It was fantastic to see some of the giant tech and social media companies attend conferences like this. These huge giants that we find ourselves talking about all the time, but we have yet to take any sort of common approach to them. Is it pure fantasy to think that news organizations, private and public, might take a more coordinated approach to our discussions with the social media and tech giants? It is increasingly clear to all of us that we need to see the development of a totally new relationship between Google, Facebook, and the other significant social media and video sharing platforms and the news media. Both sides have a compelling reason to reimagine this relationship. They need content, and increasingly in the face of criticism and regulatory threat, they need more credibility and trust. The news media needs much stronger revenues and investment, and the brilliant, brilliant technological expertise and innovation these companies bring. Time is certainly ticking away on this dialogue. This year, Facebook and Google will likely take over 50% of all digital and mobile net ad revenue worldwide. That is an extraordinary figure. We now have a situation where huge conglomerates generate extraordinary income without content investment, partly because they are a sort of source of news that the public increasingly doesn't trust. 
Meanwhile, we have news organizations, public and, and public and private, that invest in strong reporting and news reporting that still retains relatively high levels of public trust, but they're financially struggling, particularly in the digital world. In television, in particular, there has long been a value attribution across the chain from program maker to broadcaster to distributor. It is far from perfect, but there is at least an appreciation by each party of the critical codependencies. A broadcaster assigns and airs a report, and the journalist and production team are paid for that, paid for that work. Advertisers are part of the equation. Any semblance of fair recognition of mutual value is hard to find in the relationship between social media and video sharing platforms and quality news organizations. Yes, some of those companies have begun to bend and change a little, particularly Facebook, and we have to recognize that. Yes, there are now some content deals with some publishers. Yes, you will see more publisher logos on some content. Yes, Facebook has a journalism initiative and has signed up 10 publishers for a mobile app trial that pushes users to a paywall after 10 free clicks. Yes, there are other examples of this that will be quoted. But given the scale of the incomes that are being generated, given the unprecedented reach of billions of citizens, is this really enough? What about data sharing? Real concessions on prominence? Structured ad revenue agreements based on usage? The list goes on. This imbalance is undermining news organizations, organizations that are a key component of the democratic process. Surely, it is more than time for mutually beneficial discussions between us. Both of us, both sides, have so much to offer. Just imagine what we could do really working together. But news organizations, public and private, must also work together as part of that discussion. A US organization involving 2,000 media outlets, the News Media Alliance, is seeking changes in antitrust legislation in the US that will allow them to negotiate as a group with tech and social media companies. Surely, if the cutthroat competitive US market can reach that point of cooperation, we media organizations, public and private in Europe, can at least have conversations. The EU, representing public service media across Europe, is open to those conversations. In the meantime, news organizations also have our own responsibilities, and we cannot lose focus, just start blaming everybody else, particularly in public service media. The greatest protection we have is our content and our connection with our audiences. The best journalists, presenters, program makers, news organizations have always met the challenge of willful misinformation head on, on air and print. And the sheer stubbornness, persistence, skepticism, and relentlessness of great journalists cannot be rap replicated by amateurs or uh, algorithms. Nor is the val value of journalism more vivid than in specialist investigative reporting. The recent Paradise Papers investigation, the Olympic doping scandal uh, revealed by ARD, investigations that our hosts, NOS, are doing into the MH17 crash, as well as all the investigations from all, all of the organizations in this room. They are examples of how dogged persistence in our profession can gain results. Investigative reporting is one of the key contributions of news media to society and it is a core value, particularly for public service media. I've been involved in invest I've been lucky enough to be involved in investigative journalism as a reporter, producer, editor, and manager at various times since I left university. If I've learned anything during those 25 years, it is that delivering quality investigative journalism is incredibly difficult, risky, contentious, and costly. There is very little low-hanging fruit but we all need to continue to invest in it, despite the financial situations we face. Society needs this reporting now more than ever. But that journalism needs to be properly funded. It also needs appropriate regulation to protect that funding, and that regulation needs to be argued for loudly. The content generators, the people who actually invest in content and invest in news, we need to find more common ground if this truly is to be the golden age of journalism that we all wish for. 
I wish you all a very fruitful couple of days. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.